Organizations which make fast decisions are generally better. I have a countdown clock in my office showing how many days I've got left of my job because it's a five-year job. Now, why do I have that? Is it because I don't like my job? No, I love my job. The thing is that when I got somebody in my office who says, over the next three months, we can do it. I said, hey, listen to that. Look at this. I got 580 days left. We need to hurry up. Nikolai, I'm so excited for this. I've watched so many of your shows before. So thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for inviting me. I want to start with a little bit on you. So it's a bit of a weird one. What were you like as a child? I think I was unfortunately pretty normal and uh, um, slightly introvert. I read a lot. I didn't have any friends. My brother was really worried that I would perhaps never have any proper future given that I didn't socialize so much. Did you feel you didn't have friends? I, I didn't have many friends no, either. I didn't need, I, had my, I had my books. I, I just didn't need, need that many friends. So so my friends kind of came later in life. Did you always have this self-assured confidence? Like I was, no, I'm being serious. Like I didn't <laughs> no, have many think, friends and I felt like a loner and it was hard. Yeah, I thought it was pretty good to be a loner actually. Um, and uh, yeah, so I probably had a bit of confidence there. I love that. Um, did you enjoy school? Loved it. You did? Really nice. Were yeah. you good at school? I was, pre I, was, I was quite good. I was quite good. How would your teachers describe you? A studious, uh, concentrated, uh, you know, probably ambitious. <laughs> when did you find the love of finance? Oh, that was early because I was pretty keen on making money, right? So you know what I think? I think a lot of lo loners, they are keen to make money to show the world, right? Yeah. And I never felt good enough until it was like the way of proving that I was worth something. I think inferiority complexes should be really celebrated. I think it's a huge thing. That, that is what drives us, pretty much all of us. And um, so I wanted to make some money and I started to... Uh, you know, collect uh, empty bottles, you know, in Scandinavia, you get refunds for these kind of things. I sold flowers at restaurants. I did all these kind of things to make a bit of money. I love that. When did you make your first real money? <laughs> well, that was really late, actually, because uh, I didn't in my first job, which was in the city. And I did when I joined a hedge fund. And that was, uh, you know, in like 97. How old were so you? So I was, I, was, uh, I was 32, probably. 35, between 32 and 35. Did it make you happy? Um, it, it gives you some freedom to do what you want. So what I did when I had made some money was to take time off and go back to university. And I spent a couple of years studying art history. And that made me happy. So I, it's not the money that makes you happy, but it's just the kind of freedom it gives you. Mm -hmm. but, it wasn't, but it wasn't an enormous amount, but I had enough to take a couple of years break. Yeah. I think a lot of people always say, when I have this, I will be happy. And Absolutely. when I have that, I'll be happy. Did that you have that mindset? That is a total f fallacy. Is if you, the thing is that if you're not happy now, you will never be happy. You know, they, they have this study where they ask uh, students at Harvard, so do you have a good life? It's just, like, no, I haven't got a particularly good life just now, but, uh, but I will soon. It's just that now I just have got a new job. They ask the same people 10 years later. It's just like, no, I'm not so happy now, but I will be soon. And 30 years later. And the thing is that if you're not happy, you will never be happy. Hmm. And so for you, when you think about like going back to that child who was a little bit of a loner, did that change over time? And I hope that's not okay for me to ask. <laughs> it is, it, it did change not the schedule that we I planned. Don't know, just, I, don't know, I don't know intrigued. what happened there, but uh, I just became a bit more social and uh, slightly more outgoing. Um, you know, I was, uh, I grew up in a part of Norway, which was really religious and I was- Which part of Norway? Southern part of Norway is a very religious part of Norway. I don't know if you and know, I'm I, from Sheen. Right, and is that not so religious? Not so religious. No. <laughs> um. But then I kind of changed tack a bit, and I, uh, you know, became more social, got more friends, and uh, you know, just uh, uh, went out a bit more. What do you think was the biggest needle-moving moment in your career? You mentioned the entry into hedge funds there. Yeah, I think it was when I started uh, at Wharton, which is a U.S. university specializing in finance, because that really was a different type of ambitious uh, ambitions. And, um, you know, Norway is the kind of place where you're not supposed to be, uh, you know, too ambitious, at least not uh, overtly. Then you get to America and it's just like, hey, we want to conquer the world. And you are allowed to say it when you are like 22. <laughs> and I remember in class, this guy said, uh, you know, what should I do? What should I, how should I succeed? And it's just like, yeah, but what do you want to do? I just want to conquer the world. And everybody applauded. And for me, it was just like a complete unreal situation. Did you adopt that mindset from that? <laughs> no, I have not. I don't really have that mindset. But there was there was an element of that which I thought was pretty cool. So, for a child of your own, or for a young person asking you for advice, what would you say to them about doing an MBA? Well, personally, I'm not a big believer in MBAs, uh, except from if you have some kind of job and need to change direction, and you feel that you know I'm in the wrong place. I just need to 
completely do something else. Then an MBA is good. It's good as a kind of shifting mechanism. But in itself, I think uh, not so necessary. When you decided to join, you know, um, you know, your role now, was it an easy decision to leave your prior, you know, which you started, and, and join as CEO? Yeah, it wasn't so difficult, actually, because I was on my way to do something else. I had started a hedge fund. Uh, I, I worked, uh, been running it for 15 years. The learning curve was a bit was a bit flatter, and I had decided to kind of move on, leave, pass on the firm to the next generation, and then go back to university and study. And then this job came up in the Sovereign Wealth Fund, and I thought, you know what, this is just incredible. Combining my love for asset management, uh, organizational development, and then do something good for the country. So that was that was not so difficult, but it, w- it wasn't easy to get the job, right? Um, what was the pro- uh, what is the process to be seen well, you have of the to largest apply. software Well, you, you you apply and uh, you go through a lot of interviews, um, and then of course the local media was a bit skeptical because nobody knew me, and uh, the here is this unknown guy coming from London and it's a very prestigious position in the country and it's not so. Uh, yeah, it just wasn't so straightforward. Did the enormity of the position hit you? Like, as we say, it is you know, the largest in the world. I don't think it's really ever hit me because it's uh, it's a very large fund. But I don't think about I don't think about the size of it because the size is kind of uh, unreal. So, do, do you know what I love? It's on your website. You have the ticker. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's it's insane. Yeah, it's insane. So it's it so it's a ticker of, showing you know, the US real debt. Absolutely. So it's it, we ha- there is a ticker on the website. It shows the um, the the real real time value of the fund. And I thought before I joined, it's just like you know what, this is not a good idea. This makes us very short term in our thinking. We should get the, this away now. If we had taken that away from the website, there would have been a revolution in the country. They would have hated it. It's the most watched number in the country. It's very, very important, and uh, and it's and it's kind of cool, you know. What it also does, it it just um, shows how transparent the fund is. There are no secrets. Everything is open. Everything everything is out there. I, I've watched many of your interviews where you've interviewed some, and then some where you've been interviewed. And you've said before we might have some lackluster returns actually for the next few years because of the you know, environment that we're in. Totally. Given the importance of that number to the country and it being the most watched number, is there a lot of pushback? Is there a lot of anger about a, a very kind of open? Listen, there will be lackluster returns, and that's what it is. No, I think they like the fact that we do some uh, expectation management. It's important to manage expectations. I truly think there will be much tougher times ahead. I think it'll be difficult to generate returns, and we need and everybody needs to know that. So the show is done well because I managed to ask very stupid questions and get away with it. I'm going to proceed in this vein. Why is it going to get so much tougher? A lot of people are feeling optimistic. Yeah, they are, and um, because um, uh, you know, I, personally, I think it will take longer for rates to come down. I think there are geopolitical tensions which add to inflation. Why will it take longer for rates to come down? Because there are some underlying uh, there are some underlying wage increases, uh, and then when companies have to pay higher wages, they offset that by increasing their own selling prices. Mm-hmm. And then you have some climate effects, you know, there are worse harvests. Uh, you have some geopolitical effects. There is more uh, producing things closer to home, which is more expensive. So you just have a lot of things like that pulling in the same direction. Okay. And so these kind of underlying inflationary pressures create a challenging environment going forward. I'm sorry to ask crap question. Is that like a three year period? Is that like a five year period in your mind? When does that change? I think it could last for quite some time. Like 10 years? I don't know, but um, I think the next five years could be could be much more difficult. Hmm. How does one change their investing as a result of that? By becoming more long term, by focusing in on uh, quality companies which can p- compound, by looking for market share gainers, and by becoming more contrarian. So taking the opportunities that comes from volatility. I always love Warren Buffett's investing style, which is, you know, I invest in things that don't change over time. People will always love like a Mars bar or ketchup or whatever that may be. Or a Coca-Cola. Or a Coca-Cola. When you think about like market share gainers, what what does that mean to you? Because like one would say Google, but some would say Chat GPT. You've spoken Sam challenges that. Yeah, I think Does so. That... I'm not really thinking about technology because that's a bit too complicated for me. I mean, that's because that changes so fast, and God knows who is going to be the winner in in AI or chips or these kind of things. I'm more thinking about kind of steady eddy, you know, market share gainers. 
like a cosmetics company which takes half a percent market share every year or things like that. Does that not get threatened by technology too? It is a world not becoming... Well, some, uh, I think some companies and some products are not threatened by technology. I think, for instance, look at cosmetics. You know, women have painted themselves in the face for 2,000 years. Do you think they will, do you think they will stop? Do you think all women will say, listen, now we're going to have a level playing field. Nobody's ever going to use any cosmetics. I just don't think there are. And I think it's tied into it's tied into vanity. Uh, men are increasingly I vain. I agree, but uh, so, 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 so I don't think, so for instance, there, I don't think technology will move it. Now, an elevator company, are we going to invent a way, the, the way we need to move up in the building? I, I just don't think so. I think we'll always need elevators. I agree on the elevator side. I, I got nothing for you on that one. On on the makeup, you know, TikTok shop enables creators to create their own brands. Oh, totally. And Absolutely. That, you know, really unbundles so much of LVMH or any of the large providers' market share. Yeah, well, I just think that when the brands become pretty big, they will be acquired by the very large companies. And you see it, for instance, in the spirits business. So, you know, let's say you're a good-looking actor, you launch your, your uh, tequila brand, well, uh, you know, uh, Los Amigos or whatever it's called. And uh, when it reached a billion, uh, somebody's going to buy it. You know, I watched uh, one of your shows. I think it was at Davos where you were interviewed. And you said, yeah, the question I like to ask is, what's on your mind? Hmm. And I was like, why don't we turn the tables? What, what's on your mind? <laughs> you know, just now I, um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, uh, we must not make small problems big. You know, there are some really small problems in life. And we are just making them big. But equally, there are some really big problems, and we must not make them small. What do you think are the small problems? But just like the everyday small tiddly things, which take up too much time, too much of your thinking, uh, you know, not important things, and you should not be spending time on it. And there are some big things. I mean, climate, big issue, very big issue. And for sure, we are not spending enough time on it. Okay. With that in mind, how do you think about how you should reshape your time then? Um, more thing on the important things. And so uh, be more conscious about how you spend your time. Is the time horizon challenging for you? Because you invest along such a long time horizon. So time is really interesting. And I think I think it's really funny. So let's say you are 20 years old. You are in such a hurry, okay? Like three months. It's et eternity. Now, you get older. I'm 57. I'm soon about to die. Suddenly, I'm so patient. Why? I mean, I, I haven't got that many years left compared to a 20-year-old, yet I'm much more patient than this young person. Why is that? It makes no sense. So your time horizon changes when it shouldn't. You know, it should be opposite. <laughs> Are you scared of dying? No, absolutely not. But the thing, but the thing about time, I think is just really interesting. I don't think we haven't really nailed the whole concept of time. And no, why are you more impatient when you are 20? Well, uh, you know, three months is a higher percentage of your life than when you are uh, 50. Right, you've seen you've seen longer time. You've seen that it pays off to be long term. But uh, but if I were to tell myself something, you know, my twenty year old self, uh, what should I, what should I what should I learn? It'd be you know, you got so much time, you know, just uh, think more long term. Speed of execution, we're always taught, is like the biggest difference between those that win and those that don't. Yeah. And with that in mind, I very much think that time is crucial, and I have to get as much out of every single day. Yeah, but that's different from thinking long term. So time of execution, <clears throat> I completely agree. Organizations which make fast decisions are generally better organizations. Mm -hmm. I have a countdown clock in my office showing how many days I've got left of my job because it's a five-year job. I've got 580 days left. 580 days. Yeah. Now, why do I have that? Is it because I don't like my job? No, I love my job. But the thing is that when I got somebody in my office who says, yeah, we can do this next, it, over the next three months, we can do it. I said, hey, listen to that. So look at this. I got 580 days left. We need to hurry up. And they say, oh yeah, oh gosh, yeah, you only have 580 days left. We need to do it straight away. So you completely change the mindset and you get this urgency into thinking. Do you think that five-year tenure is a good thing or a bad thing? Because doesn't it prevent long-term thinking? Like if you well, I think it's good and bad. I mean, you can, you can, um, you know, you can apply, uh, again. apply again, right? So you can potentially have two. Um, so um, I, I think it has got positive things and negative things. I think on balance, it's probably neutral. Yeah. Do you feel the pressure? I think I would have felt the pressure even if I had a tenure. I get that. No, I totally get that. Well, when you think about like how others in sovereign wealth funds do and engage in what they do, who do you respect and why? There are a lot of very good f funds out there, right? You have the Canadians. Yeah. Uh, they are they are very strong. They are long-term thinkers. 
they have good institutions, good organizations. You have something like GIC in Singapore, where it's very strong. I would say what I admire with funds is when they are transparent. Now, the Norwegian fund is the most transparent fund out there. And I can say that because we, we won the awards for being the most transparent fund in the world. So I'm not even bragging. It's just a fact. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's so good. Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. it's good to be transparent. Everybody is on the same page. Every know, everybody knows, uh, you know, what's the agenda? What are we driving for? What are you trying to achieve? And it, and it establishes trust. I don't know. It assumes everyone has the same IQ and EQ. And actually, sometimes people need to be... Uh, encouraged along and maybe not know the whole truth because I don't think actually a lot of people are as, as good as we give them credit for. Well, I, disagree, I beg to disagree here. I think the more people know the truth, the better it is. The more uh, the more everybody know all the facts, the better it is. When you think about, I, I love this, you asked it with, I think it's Jane, the CEO of City, and, and you said, if you were to really have one or two numbers which measure the health of the economy, which one or two are they for you, Jane? And I was like, that's a good question. If you have that same question, how do you respond to that? Well, so what I look at is how um, how much fear and how much greed is there out there? Now, how do you measure that? Well, fear you can measure in in the, you know in the VIX index, the volatility index. You can measure, um, well, for instance, during COVID, you can measure it in. <clears throat> the amount of media on on the bad news, uh, to which extent specialists disagree with each other, what are the doomsday scenarios, and so on. So you can you can get a gauge for the fear. And gee, did we have a lot of fear at the beginning of COVID when we didn't know what it was? So I think that's that's not so difficult to measure, but it's an important one to keep track on. But then then um, you know greed. How do you measure that? That's much more difficult to to gauge, and frothiness, and to try to get your handle on that. That's really important. And so I'm wondering now, <clears throat> you know, over the last two, three days, the share prices of ARM has gone up, you know, 150% or whatever it is. I mean, something very, very high number. And what is that? Is that some kind of blow, blowout, uh, you know, peak of sentiment for tech shares? Or what is it? I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that. How do you think about measuring greed then? Well, you just have to look at what's going on in society. When when you feel really stupid because you haven't made a hundred percent return in the stock market because all your friends have, then you have to start to think. It's just when things start to look really really simple, then then there is too much greed because it's just not simple to make money. I totally agree. I'm just forever, I'm forever stuck because I've always looked at Nvidia and gone, God, that's overpriced. And I've done that for the last year, <laughs> and I've been proved thoroughly wrong clearly in my expectation that it's overpriced. And so I, I agree and I get you. Do you think greed is bad? No, not per se. I mean, greed is greed is a negative word for, you know, aspiration and wishes for a better life. And so the word greed is a negative word. But the wish to create things, to make the, the, the world a better place, all these kind of things, that's that's positive. It's supposed to drive. I mean, it's 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 cool that people want to establish things and make things and show the world. What's the biggest constraint that you have because of your position that you would like to remove, and what would you do if it were removed? Yeah, I don't. I don't feel we have much constraints. So we, you know, we're a large fund. We are. Uh, we're a public sector fund. Um, for the moment, we cannot invest in private equity, yeah. which I think it's which I uh, we, we, and we now have this political discussion and and we have um, arguments back and forth with with the ministry. So uh, so we'll see what comes out of that. How does decision making work around that? It's a political process. So the ministry is asking us for advice. I the board of of the central bank. Then they give advice. Then they then they kind of go through the political process and discuss it with the politicians and then they come back with a white paper. So it's a, it's a very thorough and and really solid and impressive uh, work. You said central banks there and I saw on one interview that you did, you said you hope that central banks change the type of data that they use to inform their thinking. And I thought, how so? I wasn't really aware of what data they specialize in to, like use today. And how would you like that change? Yeah, so I, I need to be a bit careful when I talk about central banks because, you know, we are situated in the middle of central banks. So when I talk about central banks, I never talk about the Norwegian central bank. Mm -hmm. But I think it's interesting to look at the central banks. And I have uh, previously said that I thought they were a bit slow to increase rates. 
No, I think that's pretty. Uh, that's the opinion that many people have, and they have admitted it themselves. So I don't think it's particularly controversial to say. And to me, the question is just like, what kind of alternative data do you use? Do you speak to the CEO of companies and ask them what they ex expect for the next twelve months? And historically, they haven't necessarily done that. I think they probably will do it or are already doing it more. And and perhaps that will improve the decision making. You know, I, I spoke to a couple of mutual friends and they said that your content consumption is extremely voracious. And you mentioned, you know, being uh, you know so engaged in reading when you were young. What does your content consumption look like today, Nikolai? You have to be across so many things. The important thing with learning is that you need to be curious and you need to learn as many different things as you can from as many different type of people. So when you look in when you look at the social psychology studies on this, the more different type of friends you have, the more innovative and the more creative you become. Very, very important. Now I consume a lot of newspapers, I do I listen to podcasts, um, and I also learn a lot from our own podcast because it forces me to prepare for various industries and various CEOs and so on. And it's a very, very important part of learning. Do you do the prep yourself? I get help from the great analysts who I work with, but I also do. I also prep myself, so I sit during the weekends and and work. So I think it's I think it's really really cool, right? It's so, the best way to learn, right? Yeah, totally, I learned totally. so much. From Absolutely. Business. So before we had uh, Daniel Ek or Spotify on, you know, I, I have to learn about the music industry. I didn't know so much about it. And before we had Nvidia CEO, well, I had to learn about microchips, or you know, uh, did the CEO of a bank? Then you learn about that. And so it's just a fascinating learning experience. Or Bill Gates, you have to learn about a lot of things because he knows so much about so many things. When you think we've, we've spoken about kind of, um, yeah, NVIDIA, you mentioned there, we spoke about Microsoft. How do you think about like, US tech firm concentration? It is so concentrated. So yeah. I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, it's very concentrated. And you know, you have the market cap of individual companies which surpass the market capitalization of all the Swedish companies, for instance. So they are bigger than singular countries. Is that good or bad? I don't think it's good or bad. I think it's just a function of this being a platform economy where if you if you own the platform and you have the size, you just uh, gain more size. Everyone says like in every cycle there's incumbents and you know this is no different and they can always be challenged. Honestly, to me, this feels different because in in a lot of cases, the data advantage that they have and the sheer scale that they yeah. have is just bigger than ever. Nokia, when it was at its height, did not have the scale no. that Microsoft does. No, it's things. interesting. So now, for instance, in AI, it takes uh, it's so expensive to develop the new models that if you're not already a big company, you have difficulty doing it. So there is, there is an argument for this continuation of the winner takes it all just continuing. So, but I, I, I just don't know. How do you think about investing in AI super aggressively? That like you are primed position-wise mm. to actually say, hey, we can become a market leader. We can take a very forward approach. We can take a very long time horizon. Well, we we are quite close to the index the way we invest. So we would own all the big companies. You know, our biggest position is Microsoft. We have big, very big positions in, um, you know, Nvidia, AMD. Uh, Alphabet, you name them, we have. that. Those are our biggest positions. Would you do Sam's new $7 trillion project? <laughs> I mean, there's only a few people who can. Yeah. Well, we uh, the good thing here, well, the easy thing here is we only do uh, companies with a stock market listing. So even if we wanted to, uh, to we, that wouldn't be so easy. How do you think about the chip shortage problem? I have to say the the, the podcast I did with uh, Sam Altman was really really interesting. What was it? What, why was it so interesting? Because I, mean, I, I loved I, it. Because but... I felt that uh, we were looking into the future and that he knew what the future was going to look like. And he had he he has more visibility into it than most people, at least for the next kind of three three five years. When you hear him talk about it, are you excited for that future? Yeah, you are. I think it's huge. I think it's fantastic. So I ask him, I say, hey, we, we, we want to improve productivity in the fund by 10%. What do you think about that number for the next 12 months? <clears throat> and then he thinks a lot and he says, no, I think it's too conservative. I think you should try for 20% given how many developers you have. So now I run around in the firm and just say, hello, guys. How exactly are you going to improve your productivity by 20%? over the next 12 months. When you have the index-like approach that you do, what does a 20% productivity increase mean? Like more analysis? Because I, I heard you say that you wouldn't change how can't you just do more with the same? Yeah, I think we do, so better, like, we do better analysis. We do better follow-up with the companies. We do uh, you know, better work on, on the voting. We do 
I just think you improve the quality across the board. How do you think about chip shortage? This is the, one of the most challenging problems we're facing in this space. Yeah, so I don't think too much about it, to be frank, because I suspect it will take care of itself because we have commercial players here. And I just saw that AMD is uh, launching a new uh, chip, which is even faster than what was available before. And so I suspect there will be chips. Do you believe in Adam and if they are not uh, if they're not enough, then prices will go up, and then one will consume less. You're a big believer in Adam Smith's invisible. Well, on that particular in that particular case, absolutely. In other cases, I am. Yeah, no, I think I think in that particular case, it works really well. I, I don't think. Hey, I mean, it's not like capitalism is solving all the problems and it's creating its own problems, but uh, but it's got some pretty. Uh, pretty uh, good and, and well-working mechanisms. There's a brilliant you know, quote that I think to a lot, when the facts change, you know, I change my mind. Yep. I, how do you think about changing your mind? Oh, very, very important. And so when you look at the best investors in the world, they are, they are stubborn because you need to be stubborn uh, and you need to be able to sit with your positions. But when facts change, you need to change your mind. And the combination of stubbornness and agility, it's a combination which very, very few people have. There's another great investor. I'm, I'm forgetting again who it is. H, terrible thing. He talks about the willingness to be lonely in yep. your beliefs as well. Yep. When other people don't see what you see and you have to be willing to sit in that discomfort. Yep. Do you sometimes feel uncomfortable in a position that you hold because it is less obvious or lonely? Yeah, ab absolutely. But the thing is that the more uncomfortable you feel, the better it probably is. And so as long as you know that, that takes away some of that uncomfortable feeling. Are you able to, to seek discomfort, though, in positions? Yeah. Do, you, do you know what I mean? But given the position, given representing a country, you can't exactly say to your analysts, hey, let's go and find some batshit crazy things, which everyone hates right now, because that's where value is created in investing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's it's more difficult to do with, with this current fund, but it's, uh, it's ideally what you should be doing. How, how do you think about regulatory environments? I, I get quite worried when we see inc increased regulation, suddenly around Europe, especially around M&A and liquidity environments. How do you feel when you look at the regulation? Well, there is a reason why you have regulations, right? It's to prevent... Um, Bad actors. Uh, yeah. And it's to prevent another financial crisis. And so it's put there for a reason. Is there too much regulation? I mean, there could be in some areas. But generally speaking, regulation is not a bad thing. <laughs> As a technology investor, it most often is. Could but be. It's a challenge. It is, of course, holding Europe back compared to the US. Now, there are several reasons why US, why Europe is growing less fast than the US. And it struck me, I spent, I, I spent a month in New York in November and um, met with a lot of companies. And you just, there is a different thinking about speed, different thinking about risk, different level of ambitions. You know, in Europe, 5% is a high number. In the US, it's a low number. Uh, in Europe, you, if you fail, you are generally not giving an, uh, given another chance. So you have some um, mentality uh, Do you think that's still the case here Absolutely. in Europe? Absolutely. What can we do to change that? It's very difficult. It's very difficult. I, I had Larry Summers on the show. That was a fun show. And he said a brilliant one. He said, Europe's a museum, Japan's a nursing home, and China's a jail. How do you feel when you hear that? Well, he's a very clever man generally, so uh, he must be onto something. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be a good guest for your show. He doesn't uh, hold I back. Met, I have met him. He doesn't hold back. You know, it was funny. We, I posted on, I think, Twitter um, about your coming on the show. And a lot of comments said, maybe this is Twitter, but when will you hold Bitcoin? We will not hold Bitcoin. It's not in our mandate and we have no wish to have it, hmm. I don't think. And also, I'm not quite sure I fully understand the all the implications of uh, Bitcoin, but um, but we, but it's not an alternative for us. Uh, can I ask one that I feel I don't understand is China. And this was another one that came up. Like, what would make China investable for you? But we invest in great Chinese companies, and there are you know many of them which are good. You know, if you think about if you look at the ch the sentiment towards Chinese companies, it's pretty pretty rock bottom, right? Yeah, I don't think it's ever been worse in my working no. career. No, so it's the worst we've seen. Uh, so have we seen the low in uh, in sentiments? Uh, that, so that I don't know. But uh, if you look at where our sentiments really high and where they're really low, clearly U.S. Uh, offices, so real estate, very low. China, very low. U.S. tech, very high. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> do you think this that, is pretty obvious. Do you think the negativity towards China persists? I don't know. I don't know. They have some issues. They have uh, deflation there now. 
Uh, the growth is a bit slower, but uh, they are um, a lot of people and they are very hardworking. They are incredibly hardworking. Yeah. How do you think about your own investor psychology, Nikolai? Like, I think confidence in investing is very important. And I'm just intrigued over the many, many years you've been investing now. How do you think about controlling it when it's too high, protecting when you've made a couple of bad investments and I think the importance here is to well you need to you need to be stubborn you need to question yourself all the time and it is these kind of um you need to be you need to be uh, confident but at the same time you need to be a bit insecure so it's to get that balance right it's tough what are you insecure about today everything i mean you have to you have to question everything you have to question what is happening with inflation uh, what is happening to valuations? What is happening with uh, uh, technological innovation? What is happening to geopolitics? You know, where are where are the risks? What's happening to the political situation? We have uh, uh, elections and totally, we got elections all over the world. So there are a lot of things to be uncertain about. I can ask, uh, climate is one which draws a lot of uh, attention yeah. and requests for more investment. How do you think about climate costs mitigation the role that you can play if you're a small investor and you only own a couple of companies you can hide from the climate problems right <clears throat> if you own the whole world like we do you know we own one and a half percent of all the companies in the world we you cannot hide because you got one company which pollutes you pick it up in the rest of your portfolio okay so you need to care about the environment you need to care about uh you know the, the future of 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 the globe because taken to the extreme in an, an inhabitable world the value of your investments are zero so so we really need to care and that is why we uh, care deeply about the climate and why we work with the companies we're investing in, why we are in continuous dialogue with them, why we vote at AGMs, and uh, why we have a, a very um, kind of fixed policy towards this. Do you think you have a good culture at the firm? Yes, I think we have a good culture, but culture can always be better, right? Hmm. And so you continuously need to improve the culture. What could be um, better? No, I think, so culture, you can have uh, even more speed. You can have people taking more responsibility, um, you know, even deeper sense of engagement. But I mean, generally speaking, it's a phenomenal firm. And, you know, with- What a, do you think you do really well? As a make, firm? Yeah, to make it phenomenal. We've got good people um, who feel very strongly about what they do who have a passion for what they do, who are proud to work on behalf of the Norwegian population. Can I ask, and this is a strange one, with the size of the vehicle itself, where does it go back to? Like I saw your talk, I think it was a TED talk where every Norwegian's a millionaire. Like it's, and then some people are like, well, reinvest more in Norway. There's a lot of comment, reinvest more in Norway. What's it ultimately for? Well, we have the fund to safeguard it for future generations. And so it's an investment fund, and it's 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 a, it's a kind of a backup fund, right? It meant that during COVID, you could pay for, uh, you could pay for, uh, you know, various efforts and so on that many other countries couldn't really do. So it's a it's a combination it's a combination of the two. Now we can uh, the government can spend three percent of the fund every year, and it funds roughly twenty percent of the state budget. So it's very very important in terms of funding everything that goes on from hospitals to schools to road buildings and so on. Do you believe in work life balance? Well, <laughs> <that's enough. laughs> I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not really uh, so I'm uh, okay. So I asked uh, Jensen Huang the CEO of NVIDIA. You know, how much do you work? He said, Nikolai, there is, there is hard work and then there is insanely hard work. So I said, okay, wh what about you then? I work insanely hard. I work every day from I wake up at five until I go to bed at nine. I work uh, every weekday, Saturday, Sunday, every holiday, I work all the time. So like, wow. But, but when do you relax? Yeah, but I relax all the time, he said, because I love what I do. And I think if you really love what you do, it's not going to feel like work. I get that, but then there is also, there do, is also do, time and, with your, your spouse, your kids, yeah, yeah, sure. your mother, your father. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, a lot of Americans are devoid of that. Yeah, well, so I'm not devoid of that. Uh, I have both uh, kids and a wife. Uh, but uh, how, how old are your kids? Well, they're in the 20s. So I set aside time, uh, you know, for them. But I, I work a lot because, because I love what I do. What does it mean to be a great father in your eyes? Like what is great fatherhood to you? It's uh, to show unconditional love. It's to spend time 
with them. It's to listen to them. And has your style of parenting changed over time? When you look <laughs> back to you know when they were literally born, and to now, has has your views on what good parenting has changed? I think, uh, and then you and then you have to be pretty. Hand- you you work hard uh, on parenting for some you know for some years, and then I think it's really hands off. You need to just let them do, uh, support them in what they do, make sure they know that you're that you're proud. And then uh, I've been very lucky to have a, a wonderful uh, wife who's uh, spent a lot of time on on the upbringing. So that's that's been a big a big thing. Yeah, a big gift. Can I ask? We're kind of flipping back to culture, but I guess it's also relevant with kids. How do you create environments where people feel they can say anything? Often people don't actually. Whether it's with CEOs of huge organisations, CEOs of Goldman Sachs, City. To stand up to someone and say, actually, Nikolai, I disagree, and we could be doing this internally. How do you think about creating cultures of safety where team members or children can say, I, I disagree? Well, the most important thing is to admit mistakes yourself. You have to stand up, <coughs> admit mistakes. That's the only way to make it safe for other people. And it's very tough. But the interesting thing is that if, you, if, if they think that you are pretty clever generally, and you admit mistakes, do you think they trust you more or less? More. More. They trust you more. So it's quite counterintuitive, but it's a it's a fantastic thing to admit mistakes. Is vulnerability in leadership good? And is there a limit oh, yeah, to it? Yeah, sure. I mean, if you are like a complete moron, it doesn't work. Okay, <laughs> you must be you must be genuinely uh, uh, not stupid. Okay, but it's not they've got no <laughs> idea what we're doing. As long, as, what as even as is AI? No, no. But as long <laughs> as long as they think that you are clever, then uh, admit mistakes is really good. You've met some of the most impressive and incredible leaders of companies where you, know, you own one and a half percent. When you think about it, they're not the best because that would be obviously choosing favorites, but just like the most memorable meetings with CEOs you've had. It could be through the podcast or through meetings. Is there one or two that stand out? Do you know one I, I'm really fond of is a guy called Albert Benny in Switzerland. He's, he's the chair of both a company called Lonza and Geberit. And I did a podcast with him and, and actually he was the first guy I rang when I got the job in the Southern Wealth Fund. And I asked him, Albert, I just got a new job. What should I do? And he said, well, <laughs> you need to talk to a lot of people in the firm <clears throat> so that you get better data points, so that they get to know you because they don't know you. They need to, then they, they need to get to know you. And when you, make, when you uh, in, investigate change, it's easier to get through when they have feel they participated. And you need to talk to people who are you know, the same level as you, below you, all parts of the business. Then you need to decide, what am I going to work on here? What am I going to change? Pick a few things, not many people, put it through together with a whole leader group and don't go too fast. The people who fail are people who try to do too many things too fast. And there were a couple of times in the beginning after I got the job where we clearly were moving too fast. And it was like as if the, the lower body, you know, was kind of not in sync with the upper body. In what way? Because the value just accrued and appreciated. And... No, no, it was just like we were just trying to make too much change in the organization. You could just feel that the organization didn't want to do it. And it's very important. You don't want to, you don't want to, um, you don't want to kind of uh, uh, trigger the, uh, the immunity system of an organization, right? So if you try to do too much thing, the whole organization is just trying to expel you. It's just want to get rid of you. You're a nuisance, right? It's as if your body was trying to get rid of some bacteria. And so that's why you shouldn't go too fast. When you think about the one or two things, then you thought, okay, we're going to focus on these one or two. These are the things that you want to be remembered for with your tenure. Yeah, they were crystal clear. One, it needs to be performance focused. You know, we needed to focus in on performance because otherwise we will just not uh, have a reason to exist. Then it was the people, spend more time on developing the people inject more love and care. Uh, and then the last thing was communication. More communication internally and more communication externally. So we had three things. You mentioned the communication there. You know, you are CEO of, as we said, the largest. Doing your own podcast is like, it's a, others don't do it. Talk to me about the discussion point for that. And how did that kind of come to be where you're like, nah, not only, because most would also say, oh, we should do one CMO or head of marketing, you do it. And pass it off. You took the reins on this. You do all of the shows. Yes, I do. Um, 
and um, the thinking was, you know what? We are a big fund. We are. What is what is the what is transparency taken to the extreme? Well, that's showing all the Norwegian people what they own. I thought we potentially have access to all these fantastic CEOs. Not many other people have, and certainly not many other Norwegian podcast um, people had access to them. And so we. We started it. We thought it'd be good for uh, for the general listeners. It'd be good for CEOs. It'd be great for students. We got tens of thousands of students listening, and um, and it's proven to be really good for recruitment too. So, you know, um, the applications now for our positions in New York and London have just gone up. Do you feel you've got better as an interviewer? I think you get better. I bet you're better than than you were a thousand shows ago. I was terrible. Oh, you're, people, good, you're, people, good, you're good now. People always say you're to me, oh, you know, I could never do what you do. And I say, I've done 2,700. 3,700? 2,700. Wow. What, 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 what's the main way you got better, you think? Definitely feeling much more natural. I was very staccato. Also, like, the best interviewers are able to have a schedule yeah. and then move away from it and engage in the natural flow of conversation, yeah. but then bring it back to the schedule without it seeming staccato or cut off. Yeah, you need to you need to follow up. Yeah, you need to have follow up questions, but at the same time, you need to move it forward. And it's that combination I think is important. Are you ready for a quick fire? Sure. Okay. So. Is it, you asked this one of, of Jane at City. Is it important for you to be liked? I don't particularly like to be hated, but it's not. Uh, but you can't you can't always be liked uh, all the time. Uh, but ideally, what you do is going to make you uh, better and perhaps liked in the long term. What does a day in the life of you look like? Just if, if you would have a standardized day. I know there's travel, which kind of makes it. A well, so the cool thing is I don't have any. The days are not similar. But I wake up at let's say six or before six. I read a lot of papers. And then I go to the office. I speak to, I have just different types of uh, meetings with uh, my colleagues, the investment colleagues, the ministry. Um, I do a podcast a week. I do, I don't know, it's just so varied. Unbelievably varied. We have offices in London, Singapore, New York. I travel. I just have How a really How do you gym, day. exercise? I go to the gym. It may not look that way, but I go to the gym three days a week in the morning and then I go in the winter cross country skiing every weekend Saturday and Sunday gym three times a week is good do you go to bed early? 9.30 oh, early okay. well I, I think that's pretty late <laughs> <laughs> do you find it easy to go to sleep? Yeah. you must have a yeah. lot on your mind yeah like that has it always been like that? yeah <laughs> okay what are you most concerned about in the world? now we got some big climate issues we got some big geopolitical issues What's the best investment advice you've ever received? Investment advice is to be long term and long term and contrarian. That's where all the money is. I agree. It's just the single hardest thing, as we said, to be willing to be lonely for so long in the face of so much criticism and disbelief. I um, listened to a lecture by Mark Andreessen at Stanford many, many, many years ago, and he said, "You know what? You, if you have this, uh, this X, if you have this kind of uh, two X's, one is." right and wrong and the other one is consensus non-consensus all the money is where you, you are right non-consensus and uh i'm really excited because i am going to meet mark andreessen uh in march is so he, if you have any is questions he coming on your show? N- uh, no but i'm seeing him it'll be a good one he, he's a special man tell me what's the kindest thing anyone's ever done for you you know the, the kindest thing anybody sent to me it must have been you know, my mother who spent some, so much time with me and who, in a way, was pretty sacrificing in the way she did things. And I think, so I, I generally, generally, generally speaking, I think mothers are just the best, you know? I liked you so much before this, but I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. My, I wouldn't be anywhere without my mother. What did you learn from your mother about parenting? I learned a lot from mine, but I would hope Un- Unconditional love, that you were always okay. My mother always told me you can never tell your children enough that you love them. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Yeah. Tell me, what's the biggest investment mistake you've made? During the financial crisis, we were invested, this was in my previous company, invested in a, in a, a kind of a subprime lender. And it's a, it's a shitty business. And bad businesses attract bad people. And there was accounting fraud and all that kind of stuff. And we just lost a lot of money. So I would never, I would never invest in a, in an, an ethical or uh, any company that did anything that wasn't really good. You mentioned, you know, the, the bust and the financial crisis. Uh, Rudyard Kipling, how do you keep your head when all about you are losing theirs? By um, zooming out 
understanding that this is going to be one point in time and that normal normal tiles, times will come back. If you were to give young people listening, students who listen to your podcast, students who listen to this, a piece of advice as they enter a workforce today, what would that piece of advice be? Think long term, do your own things. Uh, don't try to be like everybody else because uh, that's not going to make you very happy. And, and, and by the way, as an investor, there isn't going to be any money there either. Mine's also like, work 10% harder. It's so easy to be great now because I think everyone else is kind of mediocre. Do you think so? I really do. Really? Yeah, it's really, if you want to have a company of 500 people, they're not A star people. You want to really get that job, follow up, send that email that night before, send that email after, notice the little things, do the work beforehand, know that you grew up in X religious town and have that little bonding moment before. Put in the extra 15% understand the person better. You for sure need to work hard. That's uh, that's very important. Final one. What are you most optimistic about looking forward? I'd like to finish on a tone of optimism. I think in a, in a world of AI and so on, we need to lean in more on, on the human beings and what it is that make us human. And that's empathy and that's uh, empowerment and it's encouragement, encouragement. And what never ceases to surprise me is the type of power you can unleash if you give people responsibility and trust. And that just makes me so optimistic about the future. Listen, Nikolai, I've loved this. Thank you so much for answering my meandering questions. And you've been an incredible guest. It's been great being here. Big thanks.